great plays. The National Broadcasting Company presents Great Plays, a series of famous plays selected to show the development of drama from the sunrise performances in ancient Athens down to the contemporary theater. Mr. Burns Mantle, outstanding American drama critic and known throughout the country for his yearly volume of Broadway's best plays, will act as commentator at today's production of Redemption by Leo Tolstoy. Mr. Mantle. By way of contrast, we are giving you something fairly modern and quite Russian as the great play of today. Count Leo Tolstoy's redemption was written out of the misery of Tolstoy's search for an understanding of life in 1900. We had no contact with it as a written play until 18 years later, but it belongs to the early days of the realistic drama and is, in many of its scenes, tremendously dramatic and soul-searching. The Living Corpse was Tolstoy's cheerful title. Tolstoy, as a dramatist, occupies an interesting position in the history of the world's theater. After devoting his early writing years to the novel, he turned to the drama. This great lover and teacher of humanity was forever in search of the truth, the plain, unvarnished, brutal truth. Whenever he found it, or thought he had found it, he gave it the freest expression of which he was capable. All the Tolstoyan adventures resulting in the reordering of his life stem from his personal spiritual revelation. It is told of him that his first realization of human injustice followed his experience as a gay lad of 19 when after he had spent a happy evening feasting and dancing at a great ball, he found his peasant coachman practically dead from freezing when he returned to his drushki. He came to hate war through his adventures as an artilleryman in the Crimea. He could not stand the sight of one Christian killing another and claiming God's endorsement. His revulsion toward the drastic processes of the law followed his sight of a public execution in Paris. His determination to live as a peasant followed what he accepted as the peasant's discovery of a simple and holy faith. He later decided this was a purely selfish and superstitious search for personal security. Tolstoy's effort as a dramatist seems always to be to expose humanity to itself, however ugly the picture may be, and to follow the exposure with a promise of redemption through spiritual awakening and understanding. The basis of the play Redemption is a case that came before the Russian law courts in which a husband sought to free his wife by letting it appear that he had killed himself. The law interfered and great suffering resulted. The story of redemption is so simple that it needs no illumination from me, Arthur Hopkins wrote after he had produced the play in 1918, and it had run for 204 performances with John Barrymore and Helen Wesley in the cast. The characters, continued Mr. Hopkins, may walk in strange lands without introduction. They are part of us. Fedor is in all of us. His one cry, there has always been so much lacking between what I felt and what I could do, instantly makes him brother to all mankind. In our cast today, Tom Powers is the Fedor, Mona Hunger Hungerford the Masha, as she was in the Hopkins production, and Kay Strozzi the Lisa. When redemption opens, Fedor, its hero, has deserted Lisa, his wife, and taken up with a band of gypsies. Lisa's mother, Anna, Long disgusted with her daughter's love for Fedor and her willingness to put up with his waywardness, is trying to get her to agree to divorce her husband and marry Victor Karenian. We are at the Potosov flat in Moscow when Victor, summoned by Anna, arrives for a conference. He is announced by the maid. Victor Karenian. Show him here and tell my daughter. Greetings, Anna Pavlovna. Lizaveta sent me a note to come at once. I should have been here tonight anyway. How is your daughter? Well, I hope? Not very. The baby has been upset again. However, she'll be here in a minute. Will you have some tea? No, thank you. Tell me, do you know that Elizaveta and her husband have... Yes, I was here two days ago when she got his letter. Is she positive now about their separating? Oh, absolutely. To come to this decision has caused her much pain, but now it's final. And he understands perfectly that his behavior has made it impossible for him to come back on any terms. Why? After breaking every oath he swore to decency, how could he come back? And so why shouldn't he give her her freedom? What freedom is there for a woman still married? Divorce. He promised her a divorce, and we shall insist upon it. But your daughter was so much in love with him. Oh, her love has been tried out of existence. Remember, she had everything to contend with. Drunkenness, gambling, infidelity. What was there to go on loving in such a person? Love can do anything. 
Oh, how can one love a rag torn by every wind? Do you suppose it's agreeable for me to have my daughter admit her marriage a failure? But anything's better than for her to throw away her life in a lie. Yes, I know. Well, here she comes. I'm sorry to have been a little detained, Lisa. Oh, thank you so much for coming. Victor, I have a great favour to ask of you, something I couldn't ask of anybody else. I'll do everything I can. Well, I think I'll leave you two young people to yourselves. Oh, please, Mother. Victor, Phaedra wrote to me saying it was all over between us. But that hurt me so, bewildered me so that, well, I agreed to separate. I wrote him saying I was willing to give him up if he wanted me to. And now you're sorry? I feel I oughtn't to have said yes. I can't. Anything is better than not to see him again. Victor, dear, I want you to give him this letter. Give him this letter? And tell him what I've told you and, and bring him back to me. I'll do what I can. Tell him I will forget everything if only he'll come back. Are you... Are you surprised I asked you? No. Well, uh, candidly, yes. I am rather surprised. But you're not angry. Oh, you know, I couldn't be angry with you. I ask you because I know you're so fond of, of him. Of him and of you, too. Thank you for trusting me. I'll do all I can. I know you will. Now I'm going to tell you everything. I went today to a Fremoff's to find out where he was. They told me he was living with the gypsies. Of course, that's what I was afraid of. I know he'll be swept off his feet if he isn't stopped in time. So you'll go, won't you? Where's the place? It's that big tenement where the gypsy orchestra lives, on the left bank below the bridge. Tell him... Tell him I've forgotten everything and that I'm here waiting for him to come home. Do it out of love for him, Victor, and out of friendship for me. I'll do all I can. Goodbye, my dear. Goodbye, Victor. At the gypsies, in a room that is beautiful in the shadows cast by flaring torches, Fedor is lying on a sofa, his coat off, his eyes closed, drinking in the music. Beside him sits Masha, a beautiful gypsy girl. Asleep? Shh. Don't talk. lovely things that music says. Where does it all come from? What does it all mean? Masha, sit close here beside me, my angel. To think that men can touch eternity like that and then nothing. Nothing at all. Turn my soul inside out. Do I? But what was it I asked you for? What? Oh, money. Voila, mademoiselle. Look at this strange creature. When she sings, she rushes me into the sky. And all she asks for is money. Little presents of money for throwing open the gates of paradise. You don't know yourself at all, do you? What's the use of wondering about myself? I know when I'm in love. And I know that I sing best when my love is singing. And do you love me? I love you. But I'm a married man, and you belong to this gypsy troupe. They wouldn't let you leave it. Oh, the troupe's one thing, but my heart's another. I love those I love, and I hate those I hate. Ah, you must be happy to be like that. I'm always happy when handsome gentlemen come and say nice things to me. <laughs> Someone asking for you, Fedor no, Who is it? Don't know. He's rich, though. Fur coat. A fur coat? Well, show him in. Who wants to see you here? Who knows? Ah, Victor. You're the last man in the world I expected to break into this enchanting mirror. 
take off your coat and they'll sing for you. I want to talk to you alone. No? What about? I've come from your home. Your wife gave me this letter. Do you know what's in this letter, Victor? Yes, I know. But really, Fred, please, you don't please, know... please don't think I'm drunk and don't realize what I'm saying. Of course, I am drunk, but I see everything very clearly. Now, go ahead. What were you told to tell me? Your wife asked me to find you and to tell you that she's waiting for you. She wants you to forget everything and come back. Failure. you. Lisa wants you to come home. Yes. I ask you not so much for her as for myself. You're a much finer person than I am, Victor. Of course, that's not saying much. I'm not very much good, am I? But that's exactly why I'm not going to do what you want me to do. How could I? Come along to my rooms, Fadia, and I'll tell her that you'll be back tomorrow. Tomorrow's can't change what we are. She'll still be she, and I will still be I tomorrow. No, no. It's better to have the tooth out in one pull. Didn't I say that if I broke my word, she was to leave me? Well, I've broken it, and that's enough. Yes, for you, but not for her. You know, it's rather odd that you... Of all men should take so much trouble to keep our marriage from going to pieces. Good heavens, Fedya. You don't think... Come now, my dear Victor. Come, you shall hear them sing. Masha, tell them to sing. What's his name? We must honor him with a song. (laughs) Oh, yes. Honor him by all means. His name is Victor Mikhailovich. Victor, my lord, son of Mikhail. It's hopeless. I must go. Where's Victor? Oh, gone. All right. May the devil go with him. Masha, do you know who that was? I heard his name. Ah, he's a splendid fellow. He came to take me home to my wife. You see, she loves even a fool like me. Hmm, look what I'm doing. Caressing your hair. You should go back to her and be very sorry. Do you think I should? (laughs) I don't think so. I think I shouldn't. Of course. You needn't go back to her if you don't love her. Love is all that counts. Yeah, and how do you know that? Well, I just know it, that's all. Yeah, Masha, that's wonderful, divine. If I could only lie this way forever, with my arms around the heart of joy, and sleep, and die. Oh, why is it I love you so? Masha. Masha, Masha. What does that mean? If you loved me by now, you would have had your divorce. You say you don't love your wife. But you stick to her like grim death. You know why. Nonsense. Oh, they're right when they say you're no good. You can never make up your mind. The only joy I've got in life is being in love with you. Oh, it's always my joy, your love. But where's your love and my joy? Well, Masha, after all, you've got all I can give because you're so young, so beautiful, that sometimes... You've made me know how to make you glad, so why torture yourself? Oh, I won't. If you're sure you love me. Ah, my beautiful young Masha. You do love me? Of course, of course. Only me? Only me? Darling, only you. Sophia. Sophia Karenya, Victor's mother, <clears throat> sits reading a book in her boudoir. She is a great lady of 50 or over who has tried a little obviously to make herself appear younger. A visitor is announced. Prince Sergei Abreskov. Show him in, please. Dear me, I I hope my hair is arranged properly. Madam Karenian, I hope that I'm not de trop. Ah, you know well that you are always welcome, Prince. Tell me, you have received my letter. I did. Oh, my dear friend, I begin to lose hope. She's bewitched, Victor. Positively bewitched him. He's changed completely since that woman, Elizabeth Potosova, left her husband. He's in love, and when a man's really in well, love... our time, love could remain pure, coloring one's whole life with a romantic friendship. Such love I understand and value. However, the present generation refuses to live on dreams. But tell me more of Victor, your son. No, oh, there's not very much to say. He seems bewitched. Did you know I'd called upon her? Victor pressed me so it was impossible to refuse. But, dear merci, I found her out. So I merely left my card, and now she has asked me if I could receive her today. 
and I'm expecting her at any moment now. Really, really, I need your help. Thank you for the honor you do me. You realize this visit decides Victor's fate. I must refuse my consent. Oh, oh, but that's impossible. Have you met her? I've never seen her, but I'm afraid of her. No good woman leaves her husband. She should bear her cross without complaint. What I don't understand is how Victor, with his religious views, can think of marrying a divorced woman. But, Cherami, why not approve of the inevitable? After all, suppose he conceived a passion for someone, <clears throat> well, uh, not a good woman. How can a good woman leave her husband? Mm, here, here comes your son. Oh, Prince Sergei? Mother, I've come to tell you that Elizaveta Potosova will be here directly. Do you still refuse your consent to my I marriage? I most assuredly do. Oh, Mother dear, I just want you to know her. Oh, how can you want to marry Lisa Potosova, a woman with a living husband? Mother, that's cruel. Life is too complex to be managed by a few formula. Why are you so bitter about it? Come, come, Victor. You know your mother speaks more severely than she could ever act. I shall tell her exactly what I think and feel. But I hope I can do it without offending her. I'm sure of it. Here she is. I'll go. Elizaveta Andreevna Protosova. Now, Mother, be gentle. I'll leave you. Show her in. Please remain, Prince Sergei. I thought you might prefer a tete tete Oh, no, no. I'd, I'd rather dread it. And if I want to be left alone in the room with her, I'll drop my handkerchief. It all depends. Oh. How do you do, Elizaveta? It is most kind of you to come to see me. I'm so grateful that you permit me. You know Prince Sergei Abraskov? Yes, I've had that pleasure. My niece has spoken often of you. Yes, we were great friends. I never hoped that you would wish to see me, madame. I know your husband quite well. Uh, the last time I had the pleasure of seeing you was in those tableaux at the Denishovs. You were charming in your part. How good of you to think so. Yes, I remember perfectly. Sophia Karenian, please forgive me if what I'm going to say offends you, but I don't know how to cover up what's in my heart. I came here today because Victor Karenian said... Because he said that... Because he... I mean, because you wanted to see me. It's rather difficult. But you're so sweet. There, there, my dear child. I assure you there's nothing in the world to... Pardon, Madame Carignan. You, you've dropped your handkerchief. <clears throat> Permit me. Ah, oh, five o'clock already. Madame, in your salon, pr pleasure destroys the memory of time. Y you will excuse me, please. Au revoir, mon ami. Au revoir. Now listen, my child. Please believe how truly sorry for you I am. But I love my son alone in this world. And I know his soul as I do my own. I know. He's never loved a woman before. You're the first. I don't say I'm not a little jealous. I am. But that's something we mothers have to face. I was ready to give him up, though. But I wanted his wife to be as pure as himself. And I? Am I oh, not... forgive me, my dear. I know it's not your fault. You've been most unhappy. But you must know how strongly my son has always felt about divorce. Yes, I've thought of all that, Lisa, my dear. You're a wise woman. And you're a good woman, too. You can't want to cripple him so that he'll be sorry all his life. Yes, sorry, even though he never says a word. If you could persuade him not to marry me... You know I'll agree, don't you? Yes, I know. But I think I love you, too. I really do. Oh, it's all so dreadful. If only he had fallen in love with you before you were married. He... he says he did. But he had to be loyal to his friend. Oh, it's heartbreaking. But let us love each other. And God will help us to find what we are seeking. We are back at the gypsies. Now the room is practically deserted. Fedor sits by himself at table, bottle and glass at hand. Out of the shadows, Prince Sergei appears. Excuse me, Fedor Protasov. Hmm? I'm afraid I'm intruding. With whom have I the honor? Ah, Prince Sergei. How do you do? Well, to begin, I've come... Excuse me, Prince, but my present social position hardly warrants a visit from you. I know that. But to be as brief as possible, Victor Karinin, the son of my old friend Sofia Karinina, and she herself have asked me to discover from you personally what intentions you have regarding your wife. I've got no intentions. 
I've given her full freedom. I know she loves Victor Karenian. Let her. Personally, I think he's a bore, but he's a good bore. Well, they'd probably be very happy together, at least in the ordinary sense, and may the good Lord bless them. Yes, but we... Please don't think I'm jealous. Oh, if I've said Victor was dull, I take it back. He's splendid, very decent. In fact, the opposite of myself. And he's loved her since her childhood. Mm, yes, I think she's always loved him more than she would admit to herself. This feeling of mine has been a black shadow across our married life. No, I don't suppose I should be talking like this to you. Please go on. My only object in coming was to understand this situation completely. And I begin to see how the shadow, as you so charmingly express it, yes. could have been... No brightness well... could suck up that shadow. And so I suppose I never was satisfied with what my wife gave me, and I looked for every kind of distraction, sick at heart because I did so. I was a shocking bad husband. I say was because now I don't consider myself a husband at all. She's perfectly free. Now well, there, does that satisfy you? I must confess that you bewilder me. You, with your gifts of charm and wonderful sense of what's right, how could you have permitted yourself to plunge into such tawdry distractions? Tell me, why did you let your life fall into this ruin? Well, first, drink. Because everything I did disappointed me so, made me so ashamed of myself. I feel ashamed now while I talk to you. Whenever I drank, shame was drowned in the first glass and sadness. And then music, not opera nor Beethoven, but gypsy music. The passion of it poured energy into my body while those dark eyes, those bewitching eyes, looked into the very bottom of my soul. And the more alluring it all was, the more shame I felt afterwards. But what about your career? My career? <laughs> this seems to be it. Once, I was director of a bank. There was always something terribly lacking between what I felt and what I could do. Oh, but enough, enough. Makes me rather nervous to think about myself. What answer am I to take back? No, oh, tell them I'm quite at their disposal. They want to marry. There mustn't be anything in their way. Is that it? Is that it? There mustn't be anything in their way. Yes. When do you... Uh, when do you think you'll... you'll have the evidence ready? Will a fortnight do? Yes, I'm sure it will. May I say that you give them your word? Yes. Goodbye, Prince Sergei. And again, thanks. Why not? Why not? No longer to be in the way, to be ashamed. And it's good not to be ashamed. Waiter, bring me a bottle of champagne. Yes, sir. <clears throat> May, uh... May I sit here with you? Who are you? It's I, Ivan Petrovich. If you want to. All right, sit down. I've heard something of this. Mm -hmm. yeah. You're going to write an answer to the demand, is that it? I'll help you. I'll tell you what to say. Speak out. Say what you mean. Hit straight from the shoulder. That's my system. Hello? What's this in the box? I, I... Ah, gun. Going to shoot yourself, of course. Why not? I understand. Stand. They want to humiliate you and to show them what courage is. Put a bullet through your head and heap coals of fire on theirs. I understand perfectly. I understand everything and everybody because I am a genius. Ah. The waiter has brought champagne. Thank you, my friend. No, you're very welcome. Ah. Here's to your immortal journey. May it be swift and pleasant. Why should I stop you? Life and death are the same to genius. I am dead during life, but I live after death. You kill yourself in order to make a few people miss you. But I am going to kill myself to make the whole world know what it lost. I won't hesitate or think about it. I'll just take the revolver, one, two, and all is over. But I am uh, premature. My hour is not yet struck. Eh, take back your revolver. But I shall write nothing. The world will have to understand all by itself. The world. <laughs> what is it but a mass of preposterous creatures who crawl around through life, understanding nothing, nothing at all? Do you hear me? Oh, I'm, Please, uh, I'm not uh, talking to you. All this is between me and the cosmos. Uh, pardon me. Uh, uh, I shall have another drink. 
Oh, go away, please. Away? Me? Yes, 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 yes. So be it. I shall go away. I'll not deter you from accomplishing what I shall commit. All in its proper moment, however. Only I should like to say later, this... Later, 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 but go now. Very well, very well. But wait for me to come back. I have something rare to tell you, something you'll never hear in the next world, at least not till I get there. Goodbye. Uh, goodbye. And uh, good luck. Well, he's gone. I may as well have this thing over. It can't be very difficult, the revolver. So, at the temple, just the right angle. I I can't do it. I can't do it. Marsha. Fedya, I've been looking everywhere for you. Then I guessed you'd be here. Fedya! What are you doing with that revolver? Oh, you fool! You hideous fool! Awful, it's been awful. I tried and I couldn't. As if I didn't exist. As if I weren't in your life at all. Oh, how godless you are. Tell me. Tell me, what about all my love for you? I wanted to set them free. I promised to, and when the time came, I couldn't. But what about me? What about me? I thought you'd be free, too. Surely my torturing you can't make you happy. Oh, I can look out for myself. Maybe I'd rather be unhappy, miserable, wretched with you every minute than even think of living without you. If I'd finished it all just now, you would have cried bitterly, perhaps, my Masha. But you would have gone on living. Oh, can't you even be sorry for me? I only wanted to make everybody happier. Yourself happier, you mean. But I've been happier to be dead now. I suppose you would. But, Fadia, do you know what you want? Tell me, what do you want? I want so many things. But what? What? First of all, I want to set them free. They're such good people, my wife and Victor. I can't bear having them suffer. I can't crawl through the muck and filth of a divorce. Oh, where's the good in her if she left you? She didn't. I left her. She made you think she'd be happier without you. But go on, blame yourself. What else? Well, there's you, Marsha. Young, lovely, precious to me. If I stay alive, now ah, what will become of you? Don't bother about me. You can't hurt me. But the big reason, the biggest reason of all is myself. I'm just lost. I'm no good. I won't unfasten myself from you. I'll stick to you no matter where you take me, no matter what you do. You're alive, terribly alive, and I love you. Oh, Fabia, drop all this horror. How can I? Oh, you can, you can. When I look at you, I feel as though I could do anything. Oh, my darling, my darling, you can do anything. Get anywhere you want to. Oh, so you've been writing to them? Yes. To tell them you'd kill yourself, is that it? Fadia, listen to me. Do you remember the day we all went on the picnic to the White Lakes? Mm. And you buried the bottles of wine in the sand to keep them cool while we went in bathing? Do you remember how you took my hands and drew me out beyond the waves till the water was quite silent and flashing almost up to our throats. And then suddenly, it seemed as if there was nothing under our feet. We tried to get back, but we couldn't. And you cried for help. And after, how wonderful it was to stretch out safely in the sand, in the sunlight. Oh, how nice everyone was. And you kept on being sorry for forgetting you couldn't swim. Oh, my. Fedya, don't you see? Of course she must know you can't swim. Oh, it's all getting as clear as daylight. You will send her this beautiful letter. Your clothes will be found on the river bank. Hmm? But instead of being in the river, you will be far away with me. Don't you see, Fedya? You'll be dead to her, but alive for me. In the 
drawing room of the Bertossoff's apartment, Victor Karenian is making his report of failure to Lisa. He's promised me definitely, and I'm sure he'll keep to it. I'm rather ashamed to confess it, Victor, but since I found out about this, this gypsy, I feel completely free of him. There's another woman, and he doesn't need me anymore. My only worry is the divorce. Dearest, everything will be settled soon. Now, after all, he's promised. Though sometimes, if I didn't know him, I'd think he was trying on purpose to discomfort us. Oh, no, no. It's only the same weakness and honesty fighting together in him. But, darling, I've only one desire now, and that is to have you forget the past and love as I do. What strange, contradictory instincts and desires make up our beings. Why? I don't know. When I came back from abroad, knew I'd lost you, I was unhappy terribly. Afterwards, when we became friends and you were kind to me, and into our friendship weaved a spark of something more than friendship, I was almost happy. Only one thing tormented me. Fear that such a feeling wronged Fedya. Then you told me that Fedya was gone out of your life. Out of your life forever. And there was only me. Ah, oh, Lisa, for what more could I ask? And yet the past tortured me. Victor. Forgive me, Lisa. I only tell you this because I don't want to hide a single thought from you. Oh, dearest, I'm so happy. Everything has happened in my heart to make as it you wish. All? All, beloved. For I never could say so. What is it? The secretary has come back. Oh, uh, show him here, Marina, and take the child, will this you? This will be Fedya's answer. Oh, at last. At last we shall know when. Well? He's not there, sir. Not there? He's not signed the petition for divorce, then? No. But here is a letter addressed to you. More excuses. More excuses. It's perfectly outrageous. But read the letter, dear. See what he says. Shall you need me, sir? No, that's all. Thank you. Lisa, Victor, I wrote you both without using terms of endearment. Since I can't feel them, nor can I conquer a sense of bitterness and self-reproach when I think of you together in your love. I know in spite of being the husband, I was also the barrier, preventing you from coming earlier to one another. I stood in your way. I worried you to death. Yes, it's uh, unjust, isn't it? Oh, what's all that for? However, to the point. I'm going to fulfill your wishes in perhaps a little different way from what you desire. To lie, to act a degrading comedy, to bribe women of the streets for evidence, that's one thing I can't do. I can't tell lies. My solution is, after all, the simplest. You must marry to be happy. I am the obstacle. Consequently, that obstacle must be removed. Victor! Must be removed? Oh. By the time this letter reaches you, I shall no longer exist. All I ask you is to be happy, and whenever you think of me, think tender thoughts. God bless you both. Goodbye. Fedya. Oh, he's killed himself. My secretary. Call back my secretary. Fedya! Fedya, darling! Lisa! Oh, it's not true. It's not true that I've stopped loving him. He's the only man in the whole world I love. And now I've killed him. I've killed him as surely as if I'd murdered him with my own two hands. Lisa, for God's sake. Oh, stop it. Don't come near me. Don't be angry with me, Victor. You see, I too cannot lie. Fedor has fallen very low. We find him now in a dirty, badly lighted underground dive. He is sitting at table with Petushkov, an artist. Fedor is in rags. The artist still has some hold on respectability. Both are pretty drunk. Fedor is in the midst of a confession. I know. I know. Well, that's real love. So what happened then? Now, this girl was a gypsy, reared in greed, yet she gave me the purest sort of self-sacrificing love. Such contrasts are amazing. In painting, we call that value. Only to realize bright red fully when there's green around it. But uh, what happened? No, we parted. I felt it wasn't right to go on taking, taking where I couldn't give. One night... We were having dinner in a little restaurant. I told her we'd have to say goodbye. I could hardly help crying. And she? Oh, she was awfully unhappy, but she knew I was right. So we kissed each other a long while. She went back to her gypsy troop. <laughs> Maybe she was glad to go. I wonder. Yes. Yeah. The single good act of my life was in acting decently with that girl. I loved her, really. No, it's a tender, beautiful memory. I know so well what you mean. But where is she now? I don't know. I don't want to know. 
All that belongs to another life. I couldn't bear to mix that life and this life. Mm, your life's wonderful. I believe you're a real idealist. Mm, I would have been awfully happy myself if I'd had a decent wife. As it was, she ruined me. I beg your pardon. Did you say marriage? Oh, yes, of course. Well, I've been married, too. My wife was quite an ideal woman. I don't know why I should say was, by the way, because she's still living. But there's something, I don't know, it's rather difficult to explain, but you know how pouring champagne into a glass makes it froth up into a million little iridescent bubbles? Mm. Well, there was none of that in our married life. There was no fizz to it, no sparkle, no taste. The days were all one color, flat and stale and gray as the devil. That's why I wanted to get away and forget. You can't forget unless you play. So, trying to play, I crawled into every sort of muck there is. And You know, it's a funny thing, but we love people for the good we do them. And we hate them for the harm. That's why I hated Lisa. That's why she seemed to love me. Why do you say seemed? Oh, she couldn't creep into the center of my being like Marsha. But that's not what I mean. You see, before the baby was born and afterwards when she was nursing him, I used to stay away for days and days and come back drunk and love her less and less each time because I was wronging her so terribly. Yes, that's it. I never realized it before. The reason why I love Marsha is because I did her good, not harm. But I crucified my wife, and her contortions filled me almost with hatred. I think I understand. Uh, but you say she's living. What happened? Another man loved her, a good man, rich. And I'd squandered everything I had or could get. I left her, and after a while, they asked me for a divorce. Well? I couldn't bear all the lying that was to be got through. I tried to commit suicide, and I couldn't. Then I sent my wife a farewell letter. The next day, my clothes and pocketbook were found on the bank of the river. Everybody knew I couldn't swim. Well, well you understand, don't you? Yes. But what about the body? They didn't find that. Oh, yes, they did. About a week afterwards, some horror was dragged out of the water. My wife was called in to identify it. Oh. She's in pretty bad shape, you know. Is that your husband? They asked her, and she said... Yes. Well, that settled it. I was buried. They were married. They're living very happily right here in this city. I'm living here, too. A live corpse. We're all living here together. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. Huh? But you know I've been listening to that story of yours. Huh? It's a very good story, and what's more, a very useful one. You say you don't like being without money. But really, there's no need of your ever finding yourself in that position. I don't care. I wasn't talking to you, and I don't want your advice. And I'm going to give it to you just the same. So you're a living corpse. Well, suppose you come to life again, eh? Huh? Then your wife and that fellow she's so happy with, they'd be arrested for bigamy. Hmm. The best they'd get would be ten years in Siberia. Now you see where you can have a steady income, don't Stop you? Stop talking and get out of here. Now, the best way is to write them a letter. If you don't know how, I'll do it for you. Uh, just give me their address. Hmm. And afterwards, when the ruble notes commence to drop in, get how down, great get out, you Get out, I say. I haven't told you anything. Oh, yes, you have. Here's my witness. This waiter heard you saying you were a corpse. You dirty blackmailing beast. No, oh, I'm a beast, oh, am I? Beast, yes. Yeah, we'll you see about dirty that. Blackmailing Police! Beast. Police! Victor and Lisa, having married, are living happily in the country. On the veranda of their pretty home, with a bright awning overhead and the sunlight drenching the yard beyond, Lisa and her small son have come to meet Victor's mother, Sophia, and Lisa's mother, Anna, who have come from the city with Victor. My darling Lisa. Mother. And Sophia Karenina, how do you do? Victor met me and insisted on my coming down. This is perfectly charming. Madame Pavlovna, you will see how happy they are. Here is Victor now. Mother, Lisa, oh. ah, Madame Pavlovna. Well, oh, congratulate me, everybody. I have a bit of luck. I don't have to go to town again for two days. Now, isn't that wonderful? Oh, two days? That's glorious. 
We'll drive over to the Hermitage tomorrow and show it to Mother. I hear the baby's so like his father. I do hope he hasn't inherited Phagia's disposition. After all, Phagia's heart was in the right place. Well, I'm not so sure about that. But I do feel sorry for him. I know. That's how Victor and I feel. All the bitterness is gone. There's nothing left but a very tender memory. Oh, by the way, Victor, did you bring my wool? I certainly did. Here's the wool. Here's the eau de cologne. Here are the letters. One on government service for you, Lisa. Well, Anna Pavlovna, I know you want to make yourself beautiful. And I must tidy myself up, too. Almost dinner time. Lisa, you've put your mother in the blue room, haven't you? Oh! oh. What's the matter, Lisa? What is it? Oh, he's alive! He's alive! Oh, I shall never be free from him! Oh, what does this mean? What's going to happen to him? Let me have the letter. <laughs> oh, I don't believe it. What is it? What's the matter? Why don't you tell he's us? He's alive! They're accusing us of bigamy. It's a summons for Lisa to go before the examining magistrate. Oh, the examining magistrate? No, no, he can't be. Oh, that horrible man. So it was all a lie. Oh, I hate him so. Victor, Fedya. Oh, I don't know what I'm saying. I don't know what I'm saying. He's not really a lie. <laughs> The rooms of the examining magistrate are bare. The magistrate sits at a table, an attendant stands at the door. The magistrate has just ordered the calling of the Karenian case. Madam Protossiba? Madam Protossiba? Here. Uh, please sit down, won't you? Let me see. Mm. The Karenian case. Ah, yes. You are Elizaveta Protossiba. I am extremely sorry it is necessary to ask you questions. But uh, please be calm. You needn't answer them unless you wish. Only in the interest of everyone concerned, I advise the entire truth. I've nothing to conceal. Mm, let's see. Your name, station, religion, I've got all that. You are accused of contracting a marriage with another man, knowing your first husband to be alive. But I did not know it. And also you are accused of having persuaded, with bribes, your first husband to commit a fraud pretended suicide in order to rid yourself of him. That's not true. Did you or did you not send him 1,200 rubles in July of last year? That was his own money obtained from selling his things. Mm, just so. Very well. When the police asked you to identify the corpse, how were you sure it was your husband's? Oh, I was so terribly distressed that I couldn't bear to look at the body. Besides, I felt so sure it was he, and when they asked me, I said yes. Mm, very good indeed. I can well understand your distraction. And permit me to observe, madame, that although servants of the law, we remain uh, human beings, and I beg you to be assured that I uh, sympathize with your situation. You were bound to a spendthrift, a drunkard, a man whose dissipation caused you infinite misery. But I loved him. Of course. Yet naturally, you wish to be free. And you took this simple course without counting the consequence, which is considered a crime. Bigamy. Mm, I understand. Therefore, madame, I urge you to disclose the entire truth. I've nothing to disclose. I never have lied. Do you want me any longer? Yes, I must ask you to remain. Show in Victor Karenian. I think you'll find Victor that a comfortable Karenian. chair. Please sit down also, sir. Thank you. I shall stand. What do you want from me? I have to take your deposition. In what capacity? In my capacity of investigating magistrate. You are here, you know, because you are charged with a crime. What crime? Big of it. You've married a woman already married. Sure you'll not sit down? Quite sure. Your name? Victor Karenian. Rank? Chamberlain of the Imperial Court. Your age? Thirty-eight. Did you know that Fedor Protossov was alive when you married his wife? No. We were both convinced that he was drowned. All right. Then why did you send him 1,200 rubles a few days before he simulated death on July 17th? That money was given me by my wife. Excuse me, you mean by Madame Protossov? My wife to send to her husband. She considered this money his property, and having broken all of her relations with him, felt it unjust to withhold it. 
What else do you want? I don't want anything except to do my official duty. You certainly better not conceal things which are sure to be found out. Since Protossoff is in such a weakened condition, physically and mentally, he is certain to come out with the entire truth. I advise Please you... Please don't advise me, but remain within the limits of your official capacity. Are we at liberty to leave? Sorry, but it's necessary to detain you. Kindly sit down. Show in Fedor Protossoff. Fedor Protossoff? Oh, dreadful-looking creature, this. Come here. You must answer my question. Ask them. Your name. You know it. Answer my questions exactly, please. Fyodor Protasov. Your rank, age, religion. Aren't you ashamed to ask me these absurd questions? Ask me what you need to know, only that. I shall ask you to take care how you express yourself. Well, since you're not ashamed, my rank, graduate of the University of Moscow, age 42, religion orthodox, what else? Did Viktor Korenyan and Elizaveta Andreevna know you were alive when you left your clothes on the bank of the river of and disappeared? Not. No, of course not. They knew nothing of it. They thought I was dead, and I was glad of it. Everything would have been all right, except for that beast of a blackmailer. So if anyone's guilty, it's I. Mm, I perceive you wish to be generous. Unfortunately, the law demands the truth. Come, why did you receive money from them? Why don't you answer me? The truth now. The truth? What do you know about the truth? Your business is crawling up into a little power that you may use it by tantalizing morally and physically people a thousand times better than you. You sit there in your smug authority, torturing people. I must ask you. Don't ask me. I'll speak as I feel. And you, clerk, write it down so for once some human words may get into a deposition. There were three people alive. He and she and I. We were all engaged in a spiritual struggle beyond your comprehension. A struggle between anguish and peace. Between falsehood and truth. Suddenly, this struggle ended in a way that set us free. Everybody was at peace. They loved my memory, and I was happy, even in my downfall. Because I'd cleared away my weak life from interfering with their strong, good lives. When suddenly a bastard adventurer appears who demands that I abet his filthy scheme, I drive him off as I would a diseased dog. But he finds you, the defender of public justice, the appointed guardian of morality to listen to him, and you who receive on the 20th of each month a few kopecks gratuity for your wretched business, you get into your uniform and in good spirits proceed to torture, to bully people whose households you're not fit to enter, not clean enough to pass. Then, when you've had your fill of showing off your wretched power, then when you're satisfied and you sit and smile in your complacent dignity... Be silent or I'll have you turned off. What should I be afraid of? I'm dead! I'm dead! And away out of your power! What can you do to me? How can you punish me? A cause! Take him off! Take him off! Take him off! At the courthouse, the trial of Victor and Lisa is still on. The corridors are filled with a whispering, gossiping crowd, which attendants try to control. Be silent! Let me through! Let me through! Are you here on business? No, I am the public. But this wretched peasant won't let me pass. There's no room for the public at this trial. Perhaps, but I'm above the general rule. Ivan Petrovich, a genius! Will you wait outside? Ah, Prince Sergei, you have arrived just in time. How does the case stand, Counselor? The defense has just begun. What of Protasov? He's frightfully unnerved, trembling all over. But that's natural, considering the sort of life he's led. Yes, he's all on edge, and he's interrupted both judge and jury several times already. How do you think it will end? Hard to say. The juries are mixed. At any rate, I don't think they'll find the Karenians guilty of premeditation. Do you want to go in? I should very much like to. There's an empty chair just at the left. Prince Ba! I am an aristocrat of the soul, and that's a higher title. Excuse me. Oh, there you are, Ivan. 
Well, how are things going? Speeches for the defense have begun, but this ignorant rascal won't let us in. Cast his petty soul. Silence. Where do you think oh, you are? Quiet. Oh, it's simply wonderful. When he spoke, I felt as if my heart were breaking. Such a... It's all far better than a novel. I don't see how she could ever have loved him. Such a sinister, horrible figure. Oh, yes, the prisoner, the prisoner. There he is. See how wild he looks? Petrovich, Petrovich, did you bring it? There, wrapped up in this ah. paper. Quick. Thank you, why are all those people so excited? How foolish, how vulgar, and how boring all this is. Isn't it, my friend? Ah, here is my lawyer with words, words, words. Well, well, my friend, it's all going along splendidly. Mm. Only remember, don't go and spoil things for me in your last speech. Tell me, what will the worst be? I've already told you. Exile to Siberia? Who'll be exiled to Siberia? You and your wife, naturally. And uh, at the best? Religious pardon and the annulment of the second marriage. You mean that we should be bound again to one another? Yes. Only try to collect yourself. Keep up your courage. After all, there's no occasion for alarm. There couldn't be any other sentence, you're sure? None other. None other. Ah. Pass on, pass on. No loitering in the corridor. Ah, Lisa, Lisa, this time, Lisa, it's well done. Fade you, fade you, what have you done? Oh, why, why? Forgive me, there's no other way, not for you, but for myself. You will live, you must live. No, no, goodbye. <laughs> Masha, you're too late. Ah, happiness. <laughs> So, with the echo of the gypsy song in our ears, we come to the end of Fedor's tragedy and the close of another of the great plays. Next Sunday, we will still be visiting with the realists, the play being Heinrich Ibsen's A Doll's House, in which Nora Helmer, one of the outstanding heroines of the modern drama, will be played by Ruth Gordon and Helmer by Vincent Price. You would be wise, I think, to make your armchair reservations early. Today's performance was produced under the direction of William S. Rainey, who also adapted the play for the microphone. The commentator was Burns Mantle, prominent dramatic critic. The orchestra was conducted by Joseph Haughty, and the original Russian gypsy songs were supervised by Alexander Kirillov. Included in today's cast were Tom Powers, who played Fedya, Kay Strutzi as Lisa, his wife, Lillian Tong as Anna Pavlovna, Lisa's mother, Arthur Maitland as Victor Karenian, Catherine Lane Anderson as Sophia Karenian, James Kirkwood as Prince Sergei, Mona Hungerford as Masha, Harry Neville as Petushkov, Joseph Granby as Artemiev, Harry Mestea as the investigating magistrate, Mark Smith as Ivan Petrovich, and others in the cast 
were Percy Helton, Eustace Wyatt, and Minerva Courtney. The Great Plays series is an educational feature of the National Broadcasting Company. Next week at this same hour, A Doll's House by Ibsen will be presented. A study manual, part two, giving complete background material for the great plays by Blevins Davis, who arranged for the series, is available to our radio audience at the cost of 10 cents. Send coin or money orders to the National Broadcasting Company in care of great plays, Radio City, New York. Consult your local library for reading material on the remaining great plays of the series. Today's play, Redemption, was a presentation of the National Broadcasting Company, RCA Building, Radio City, New York.